Okay, welcome to the session on Estenium, uh, two net zero with verifiable credentials. Um, it's an interesting combination of uh, two topics, a verifiable credential, I think it's a pretty known concept uh, in this kind of community. Hyperledger indie Hyperledger areas are the uh, uh, sort of known stacks in this space. Uh, and net zero um, refers to uh, carbon emission sustainability. So let's see, I want uh, to tell the story actually from a Siemens side. I'm, I work for Siemens and um, uh, what you see here is, uh, is a factory, is a Siemens factory. It's a, one of the uh, sort of uh, um, factories in a global network that was actually uh, uh, called the Lighthouse um, Network of Global Factories by the World Economic Forum. It's a factory uh, that uh, produces roughly one uh, product per second, so it has a very high. Uh, and uh, for many, many years, uh, factories of this kind of um, scale, of this kind of automation, uh, had always the, the challenge of being efficient, um, of uh, optimizing, of, of being more and more automated. And there's now a new kind of challenge, and it's, it's uh, actually a, a big challenge. It's a it's a huge challenge uh, around carbon pricing. Carbon pricing is a, a concept that tries to move to shift the burden uh, from uh, the global warming uh, to those who can actually change it, to those who who cause it also. Uh, and this uh, goes to uh, factory factories like these. Of course, not only Siemens factories. Uh, but many other factories in the world too. So for us, it's uh, a, a key product like this. Uh, it's a, a, a programmable controller, um, which is produced there, as I said, every second. Uh, and the key question is really, what is the carbon footprint of this device? Uh, how is it composed and how potentially can I change as a manufacturer also um, and the, the actual uh, footprint and then, of course, the price, because if we really go into an area where carbon is priced much more heavily than today, uh, the price or the cost of the product will be affected by this footprint. Uh, and uh, this kind of question came up inside of Siemens, but it applies in the same way uh, to a manufacturer of an iPhone, uh, of a phone, a mo mobile phone, to a manufacturer of uh, some sneakers, uh, or to a car manufacturer. In all these cases, it's always the same question. What is the carbon footprint? And uh, to make it a bit more specific, there are actually different scopes uh, when computing uh, a product carbon footprint. Uh, there's the scope one, uh, which relates to the emissions uh, that are locally happening in a factory. So this is uh, normally quite known to a manufacturer. Also, scope two um, is, is quite known. It's the electricity bill, uh, sort of very uh, sort of straightforward, the bill that, that a factory receives. Uh, but actually, the challenge is to map uh, the the values that people or the data that people and manufacturers have on on that uh, site scale down to the actual products that's not straightforward because you have variations in the type uh, in the kind of uh, energy consumption you have periods where there is a uh, higher consumption of energy maybe in the summer when you have um, um, the air condition more running uh, uh, and how do you then map it actually in a way to your product that it's also understandable? You have to average in a, in a certain way, you have to aggregate. But much more difficult is actually the scope three upstream. So the part of the uh, aggregation of scope one and scope, scope two from all the suppliers. And uh, that's uh, complicated because we live in an area where supply chains are very uh, complex. They are typically global. So the sourcing happens not just locally, but it happens really across the world. Uh, and it changes quite frequently. So knowing for a, one particular product with multiple sourcing channels for a single component, exactly what 
is now the product carbon footprint of a component is not really involves a tight uh, connection to the suppliers. Key question is also, how can you uh, request this data in a trustful manner? So how can you basically, uh, when you receive um, a product carbon footprint about um, the components that go into a product such that you can actually trust it? Uh, and then uh, shift potentially to a different sourcing. Uh, and on the very right-hand side, how you then share your own kind of product carbon footprint with the next uh, uh, um, manufacturer in, in the chain or basically with your customer. So these are the, the key questions and we believe uh, verifiable credentials can, can play a role here. It's um, a little bit different role than uh, traditionally where verifiable credentials are used uh, with individuals uh, to use um, a selected set of uh, identity attributes, share them in a, a, um, a privacy preserving and uh, sort of self-sovereign manner. Here in the context, we talk about products, we talk about companies. So it's a slight different uh, angle. Uh, and um, the scope three, what I mentioned before, is actually very important because 80% of the CO2 emissions of products in general uh, come from the upstream scope three. So that's where the biggest problem is. Within the open, within the, uh, the own context of the manufacturing, uh, that's possible to handle, that's in the domain of uh, a manufacturer. It's not straightforward, but it's uh, much easier because uh, it doesn't involve so many other parties. So in this context, uh, in this uh, chart here, you see the, um, the, the footprint of a typical product. Uh, it goes uh, quite some steps uh, and there is confidentiality involved. So the way uh, the logistics is set up by uh, the, the suppliers, is confidential to the suppliers. They would not want to share it because it's also their differentiation. The same uh, about the uh, components uh, of the parts that the manufacturers uh, manufacture. This is also confidential and should not be disclosed in the same way as the manufacturer doesn't want to disclose the suppliers and the components um, that, that the manufacturer uh, itself uses. So there is, uh, there are uh, confidentiality requirements with people, you would say privacy requirements. Here we talk about companies. Uh, so it's, it's more like around confidentiality. Um, and an important part is also to integrate uh, the aspect of recycling and the aspect of offsetting. You might have heard in um, uh, CO2 decarbonization uh, um, efforts, it's very often that companies try to uh, not really reduce uh, their emissions or their uh, energy consumption um, or change their sourcing, but they're basically try to offset by buying CO2 certificates. Uh, and this could be related to um, helping to um, grow a forest, uh, to do some uh, um, um, other means of uh, CO2 negative uh, um, efforts. Um, but unfortunately, there's a lot of uh, dodgy things happen. So th this kind of uh, integration of things, important thing to bring in here. And in all these cases, it, it has to do with trust. Uh, and uh, the concept of verifiable credentials is exactly for doing this. You typically have this, uh, these three roles of an issuer, a holder, and a verifier. Um, sometimes the subject is the holder uh, itself, but in our case, the subject is actually a product. Uh, in our case, it's uh, um, what is called the Zematic S7-1500. Uh, an issuer in our uh, setup here is uh, a technical inspection company. Here in Germany, you, you have um, them typically referred as TÜV. Uh, I think even outside of Germany, this uh, term is, qu is quite known. Uh, but in every country, you have these technical inspection companies uh, that are 
quite uh, familiar with certain domains. Uh, so for ease, since they will be used uh, for certain certification of processes um, in, in any kind of industry they, they are used. Um, and we believe they can play an important role here for bringing the trust into the system. Uh, the system cannot work by simply self-declaring that a manufacturer says, uh, okay, my product has this kind of product carbon footprint. Or what is also very typical today um, that uh, so-called life cycle assessment databases are used, where for a product, you basically go into a database, you look it up, and you, you get a, a product carbon footprint value. Uh, this is a generalization. It, it doesn't really help to uh, move forward with decarbonization uh, because it's always the same value. It won't change if anything in the supply chain uh, is, is changed. So the idea is here to use the role of the technical inspection companies as the issuer of verifiable credentials, that the issuer has insight into the factory. Um, it knows about uh, the specific way of measuring energy, um, maybe even on the factory floor. It knows about the emissions as well. And it knows also about uh, the bill of material, the bill of processes uh, that are uh, being used uh, with a product. Uh, and it can reach out to the supplier or it can get the data that the holder would request from uh, a supplier. Uh, in this case, it's always a direct relationship. So the holder has a direct relationship uh, with the supplier and would expect to receive some information, preferably in the uh, format of a presentation, of a verifiable presentation of, again, verifiable credentials that have been issued with the supplier in the step before, such that uh, the issuer can then really have the trust not only based on uh, assumptions with respect to the supplier, but uh, information coming in a verifiable way through credentials. And this requires, again, uh, an issuer, of course. Uh, it has to be a different, or it's very typically then a different issuer. Otherwise, there, there could be a collusion, um, such that we believe there's a chain of issuers, holders, and verifiers, verifiers that can stretch across the supply chain. Um, so underlying is the uh, typical verifiable data registry that, that, that helps to uh, give everybody access to the public DIDs, the uh, the identities basically of the holder would not be registered here because for the next step the holder uh, should be not known by the real identity for the end verifier. So this is exactly the confidentiality. Um, the direct relationship also exists between the holder uh, and the verifier, typically the, the customer that would request uh, for a particular product to, to issue uh, information. In the data registry, important is also to have uh, the credential schema and the revocation list. By no means there should be any uh, real PCF data. Uh, so that's also important. We have these one-to-one -one relationships um, typically established through pairwise uh, pseudonyms uh, that help to potentially also anonymize the, the, the identity of some of the parties. Uh, with every we have uh, claims associated. Uh, there would be two different types of claims. So for the uh, verifiable credential that is issued by the certifier, so the the issuer in this uh, so the certifier that plays the issuer role or is the technical inspection company the claim would relate to a product in this case it's the s7 1500 uh, there would be two values for scope one scope two uh, you could think of it also as one value for both scope one and scope two uh, and there would be more information related to the components here uh, just uh, shown as, as one component, as an example, which has a manufacturer and a unit. It's important to specify the unit, the amount of these components within the product as well, because 
the uh, multiplication has to done has to be done based on the information coming then uh, with a presentation from the supplier. And here uh, we see already that there is potentially the need for bringing in an anonymized uh, information with respect to the component that is part of the component one. So the component two that is part of component one. Also, the name of the supplier should not necessarily be revealed. So that's the claim uh, that is passed on to the supplier. There may be different kind of uh, variations, uh, uh, how this can be exactly implemented. It depends on the trust assumptions uh, between the different parties. But the basic flow would be that a customer would, re would send a request to a manufacturer uh, expecting uh, there is uh, either already information available or uh, the manufacturer would have to send out likewise a request to a supplier, uh, a tier one supplier. And the respective tier one supplier, if necessary, would send again a request uh, to the next supplier. In certain cases, and you will see it in the uh, short demo that I have also here, uh, this won't go to the very end of the supply chain. There could be cases where uh, a supplier has not the means to reach out to the next level. In this case, it would be possible to do some form of self-declaration, again, being potentially certified by uh, a technical inspection company. Um, and the actual value that, the aggregate value that goes back then to the customer would have a different quality uh, than if everything would be really based on the certification. So just uh, um, this, just to let you know that this is uh, um, uh, considered in the system that we have different uh, of um, authenticity and different levels of quality in the system. But the actual uh, flow is then coming from uh, the uh, left-hand side of the supply chain from the tier two, tier one, and the uh, towards the manufacturer and the customer, always in in pair. So there's a there is a, a issuing of a, a verifiable credential from a certified to a supplier to a, a supplier that is again, of course, a manufacturer. Uh, then a presentation of selected information that didn't doesn't necessarily have to be or can be uh, the full information that um, the the certifier issued in the and the credential um, and um, Indy uh, provides this or the concept of verifiable credential provides this where multiple credentials can be combined in a presentation can be combined mm -hmm. um, ways of selectively uh, taking information also taking also uh, only a range of, of the values so there's uh, the uh, crypto scheme of, of zero knowledge proofs also uh, available uh, so that not the full information that is issued through the verifiable credential it has to be presented to the next um, to the next player in the in the supply chain. Um, and then again, from tier one supplier, there would be a presentation to the manufacturer. Again, an issuing from the certifier that is in the same trust domain as the manufacturer, and then eventually a presentation to the end customer. There is an optional. Uh, extension here that the suppliers anonymously present certain information also to the end customer. Think about um, um, an auditing uh, kind of situation where you might want to have at the customer in quotes here. So talking about the um, the, the auditor as a customer uh, would have the need uh, to see more information directly coming from uh, the uh, parties in this in the supply chain. Uh, we think it's the entire concept has two two sides to it. Uh, so there's um, uh, a part where we have uh, the actual network with it. This must be an open network where other people can join in. Uh, there need there's need for uh, agreeing on standards uh, on uh, things like the quality. What I mentioned, it's not enough just to point to the greenhouse gas protocol. Uh, it is still too broad. Uh, there's there's need also to agree on how you exactly map values uh, down to 
uh, the, um, the, the actual product level. And then there will be connectors to the network. And here you see an example of such a connector uh, where uh, we believe different uh, industries would come up with their own kind of connectors uh, with different kind of requirements. Okay, so I wanted to give very briefly a demo. I, have, I believe I have to do it very quickly because uh, uh, we're almost at the end of the time. Uh, so let me just jump um, to a very, uh, I think it's, it's not more than uh, 30 seconds uh, to, uh, to show you how this looks like. So this is, this is an instance of such a, such a connector uh, where there's a dashboard you uh, lock in as in this case, uh, as a manufacturer, you have your overview of the factory. You could see all kinds of statistics uh, with your emissions. Um, and then you have a request coming in from, from a supplier uh, to share data. Uh, and this uh, relates to a base housing uh, where we seem to have enough data ourselves. So we send uh, a request to our supplier uh, called Reese. So here the, the view from the supplier uh, in the same tool uh, where the request comes in, there's the possibility to uh, enter data through an LCA database. Uh, there's a possibility to type in the data manually um, uh, based on um, uh, the available information uh, at hand. Uh, but there could be also a possibility then to reach out to actually the next um, part in, in, the, in the supply chain, uh, which uh, yeah, would be basically the same kind of request coming into the system and so on. Uh, here you see the quality values as well uh, that um, addresses how uh, information is provided. Database is it actually by uh, multiple steps in the supply chain and so on. Um, so this I uh, probably stop my presentation and and see if you have any kind of questions. And I look here in the questions. Uh, Estonium, uh, uh, Oliver is asking Estonium because of Estonia. Um, <laughs> Uh, no, it's the uh, um, the name Estanium comes from uh, is derived actually from the project name that we had. It was uh, called Sustainium inside of Siemens, um, but uh, externally we wanted to find uh, a name that relates to uh, sustainability uh, and, and, and environment. Um, so that's the combination of the E and the Estanium. Uh, it's a bit like a um, artificial name but it has nothing to do with the country Estonia. Any other questions? Okay, I see two more questions coming in. Which other companies are participating in this network? We are currently um, uh, looking for interested parties to launch the uh, association um, and um, we believe we are quite interesting uh, initial founding members here. Uh, I cannot disclose them at that point, um, but that's important that we have a balanced mix of parties being involved here. This should not be dominated by any kind of small circle or even a single company. The way information is shared here, how the network is run, uh, what is the uh, agreement on the uh, layer on top of um, Indian areas, it should be really um, come up by this by this uh, association. Uh, another question: Are you working with Bosch on the agents in the process? Uh, BC Gov uh, is working on a similar project. Okay, now you have to help me. BC Gov, uh, Bosch, we, we're in discussions. Yeah, um, there, there are discussions with Bosch. We any. Uh, on multiple projects, actually, uh, with Bosch, um, on uh, yeah, also on um, yeah, very similar topics. So I probably cannot talk too much in this round here. Okay, yeah, yeah, BC Gov, there's some momentum. Okay, thanks for the information. Uh, happy to follow up on this, uh, Stephen. Um, just ping me, British Columbia. Yeah, got it.
Okay, any more questions? I think we're actually over time already, but maybe one last one. Otherwise, I guess we would have to close. Good, then thanks a lot um, to all of you. Um, please ping me, please come back to me if you're interested. We have two more presentations. Tomorrow on the panel, there's a, a sustainability panel. Um, um, well, my morning uh, would be a different time in the, in the US and other time zones, of course. Um, please join. Then we have a presentation also on verifiable credentials for asset uh, management, uh, quite interesting. Um, and finally, on uh, an, the ID Union project. It's a large association, European driven, many use cases, uh, very exciting also on, around verifiable credentials. With this, okay, thanks a lot for your attention and take care. Bye.